Hey everybody, Mike Wardinsky here with NatureMike.com and today I want to talk about setting up the Photoshop workspace. More specifically, I want to talk about setting up the Photoshop workspace for photography. First, I'll start off by showing you how I set up my Photoshop workspace. Afterwards, I will go through each window individually to give you a brief description of what it does. So let's get started. Right now, we're just in the default photography workspace. So if I go up to Window and click on Workspace, you'll notice we're set to Photography. Now, there's a few things missing that I like to use, and the layout's just a little bit different than what I prefer. So I'm going to walk you through my setup, and hopefully you'll find that it's helpful for you too. First things first, I want to take the toolbar, which is on the left side of the screen, I want to bring it over to the right and I'm just going to look for this blue line and once I see that blue line up here that means this toolbar is going to dock right next to these settings over here. So I'm going to go ahead and let that sit and there we go. Our toolbar is docked. Now I'm always going to the right side of the screen rather than kind of going back and forth between the left and the right. The great thing about Photoshop is it's completely customizable. You can just drag windows wherever you want. And if you ever move windows around and you're not really sure what you did or maybe you accidentally deleted one, you can always go back to Window, go to Workspace, and then go to Reset Workspace. And we're back to where we started. So again, I'm going to go ahead and take the toolbar, drag it to the right. Do I see that blue bar? And I actually like the Histogram and Navigator menus up here, but I'm going to add a few other things. I'm going to take the Libraries menu and drag that up there. And I'm also going to add the History window. So go to Window, choose History, and here it is. Now I'm just going to grab this tab and drag it to the right. Now this can be a little confusing sometimes with these blue bars, but what you want to pay attention to is your cursor because that's what you want to line up. So if I go ahead and click up right here, yeah, I can see this blue bar around the entire window, and that's allowing me to know that when I let go, this is going to be nested with the histogram, navigator, and libraries. Moving down, we have our adjustments tab. Now, I actually like to get rid of this because we don't really need it. We have complete access to all of these adjustment layers down in the bottom of the Photoshop window. So if I just go ahead and click here, you can see there they are just in text format instead of icons. So I'm going to go ahead and throw this out. I'll hit the X. So now we have two main windows on the right hand side, but I don't like having channels and paths nested with layers. The layers are the meat and potatoes of Photoshop, so I like to leave them all by themselves. We're going to go ahead and grab channels and we're just going to drag it up until we see a blue bar up here. And that's going to nest it in between the two sets of windows. So now we have the top set, our middle set, and the bottom set. Next, I'm going to grab paths and drag that right next to channels. And then I'm going to head over to window and I'm going to choose properties. I'm going to click at the tab, drag that to the center. And lastly, for the middle, I'm going to grab character. Now, the character window has to do with typography. And a lot of times in photography, you're not using that. But sometimes you might want to add a graphic or something. So I find that it's actually pretty convenient to nest that right in the, uh, the middle window here. Now that we have the right side of our workspace set up here, I want to address this middle bar here. This is another set of windows. If I click the arrow, that will expand it and if I click it again that contracts it and we could add more windows over here up top we have the actions window if I click it it opens it up if I click it again it'll close next we have info and we're going to leave that clone source you can leave that if you'd like I don't use it a lot so I'm going to go ahead and close that out and next is paragraph I'm not going to worry about that because we're mainly dealing with photography here so I'm going to go ahead and close that out too there is one more window that I'd like to add here. So I'm going to go up to the window menu and I'm going to go down to brushes and there it is. And I'll close that by hitting the double arrow and we have our brush settings as well. 
Once you have a Photoshop workspace that you like, it's a good idea to save it. So I'm gonna go up to Window, I'm gonna go to Workspace, and then I'm gonna go to New Workspace. And we're gonna give this a name. I'll call it Mike's Photography Setup. And I'm gonna go ahead and check Menus and Toolbars. You could check Keyboard Shortcuts too if you have custom keyboard shortcuts, but I'm not gonna worry about that at this point, and I'm just gonna go ahead and hit save. Now when we go up to Window and go to Workspace, you'll see Mike's Photography Setup. And this is really cool because a lot of times when you're working in Photoshop, you might accidentally hit a key, move things around, and things just sort of disappear on you. Maybe I'm working, get out of control, and, and lose a couple of my windows. And rather than trying to rearrange everything, and figure out what the way it was before, I can just go to Window, go to Workspace, and go to Reset Mike's Photography Setup, and everything goes back to just the way you had it. Okay, now that we have our Photoshop Workspace set up, I wanna walk through the individual windows that I just talked about, and kinda of just give you a brief explanation of each one. So the first one's the histogram. If you're a photographer, you're probably familiar with this. The left side represents black, the right side represents white, and anything in the middle are your middle gray tones. So this histogram right here is saying we have a pretty well exposed photo. The left side pretty much makes it to all the way to the end of the histogram, and the right side is all the way on the right side of the histogram. That's just saying we have a full tonal range in this image. So when you're getting ready to print, it can be a good idea to come up to the histogram and make sure you're pushing the right side of the histogram all the way to the right edge. That way you know your images aren't going to be too dark. Next we have the navigator. And the navigator just shows you where you're at in the image. This is gonna be helpful if you're really zooming in and kind of working. So if I hit Command Plus on a Mac or Control Plus on a PC, I can zoom in. And then I can come over here and just kind of move around the image while using the navigator. To get back to full screen, Command-0 will fill the entire Photoshop window. That's Control-0 on a PC. Next, we have libraries. Now, you might not use libraries very much in Photoshop, but it's useful if you find yourself using a certain image or graphic over and over again. Uh, an example of this might be a watermark. So I actually have one saved here, down here. And it's gonna be a little small here because this watermark is designed for an 1800 pixel image. And the image I'm currently working on is a full resolution image. So I'll just hold Option and click and drag. And when I let go, there's my watermark. I don't need that, so I'll quickly throw that away. If you're not watermarking, you probably don't really need the library's window, but doesn't hurt to have it there either. Next is one of my favorite windows in Photoshop. It's the history window. I use this all the time. By default, Photoshop records the first action, which is importing the very first photo into your document. Now, if you're opening multiple images into the same document, it's only gonna record that first photo. And the other images will not be recorded. So if you're doing something like star trails, where you're bringing in a bunch of photos at the same time, it's only gonna record that very first photo. So a good habit to get into is to hit the camera icon whenever you're opening multiple files into the same document. This way you can always get back to the starting point of your unedited stack. Now it's important to note that these snapshots will disappear once you close this Photoshop document. So they're great for while you're editing, but you cannot come back to them at a later point. Just to show you how this works real quick, I'm gonna choose my brush, and I'm just gonna, I'll make a black brush here, and I'm just kinda draw all over the image. And let's say I like that, it looks really good. I'll go ahead and hit the snapshot, and now I can go to our starting point and our funky uh, shape here. And you can create as many snapshots as you want during the, the course of your editing process. And if you've been looking at an image for a long time, this can be really helpful to decide if you've gone too far or if you can push it a little bit further. So I use these snapshots all the, all the time. You can rename them if you'd like. I highly recommend using them. 
If you decide that you don't like black lines all over your beautiful photography, you can always just choose a snapshot and click the trash can. And that'll delete the snapshot. Next up, we have our channels window. Now the channels window can be a little intimidating to folks. It shows the luminosity of our red, green, and blue channels. But don't let that scare you off because we're going to use it just to save selections. I'll go ahead and do a, a loose selection of the sky using the quick selection tool. It's not perfect, but let's pretend that it is. And let's say that I want to save this selection. That way I can always come back to the selection because we're going to pretend that I spent a good 10, 15 minutes per perfecting this selection. There, it's refined a little bit more. Um, again, not perfect, but for this example, it's all we need. So I'm going to go to Select, and then I want to choose Save Selection. And we can call this Sky. And it's asking which document we want to save it to, which is the one that we're currently working in. And then the channel we're going to leave to new. And by default, you don't even have to worry about these settings. Just give it a name and hit OK. And if you look in the channels window, there it is. There's our sky selection. So I'm going to hit Command D or Control D on a PC to deselect. I could have also gone to select, deselect. Now if I Command click, on the sky layer, it will select the sky. And there we go, we have our selection. So this is really helpful if I wanna edit just the sky. Let's say I want to darken the sky, I can go to my adjustment layers, curves, and just drag the curve down, and that's gonna darken just the sky, and leave my foreground alone. If I turn the mask off by holding shift, it darkens everything. Now, as a photographer, you may or may not be using paths. Paths are created by using the pen tool. So if you want to do a very precise cutout of an object, you'll use the pen tool to create a path. So if I just click here, I can kind of draw a funky organic shape. In theory, I would be tracing something like that rock in the center, but for the sake of time, we're not going to do that. Once my path is complete, you'll notice I get a work path icon in the paths window. I can then click on it to rename it. I'll just go ahead and call this one Bad Selection. Now, just like the channels, I can always come back and make a selection of this just by command clicking on the actual path icon. And there we go. Next up, we have properties. And you're going to use properties all of the time. Anytime you use an adjustment layer, you're going to be making adjustments to that adjustment layer in the properties window. So it makes sense to have that here. And in fact, I'm just going to move it over here to the left side of the window. And to show you how this works, I'm just going to go ahead and add an adjustment layer. And we'll do something like a curves adjustment. And you'll notice that the properties window automatically populated with the curves adjustment. So we'll just go ahead and add an S curve to make a little bit of contrast. Now the results are a little stronger than I'd like because this image has already been edited, but I just wanted to show you how this works. The properties window is also really useful for editing mask. So I can go ahead and draw a shape with the lasso tool. And again, maybe add a curves adjustment layer. And I'm just gonna darken the center. And if I wanna feather the mask, all I have to do is click on the mask and the properties window will automatically update to the mask properties. So if I'd like to feather the mask, I just go to the feather slider and drag it up, maybe somewhere around 700 pixels, and we get a nice soft transition. Now I can invert the mask by clicking Command-I on a Mac or Control-I on a PC, and we have a nice vignette. Lastly, in the middle section is our character. And again, this is just for if we're gonna be using text. I'll click the little text icon, and we'll just call this sky. And then I can come, I'll hit the move tool to close out that text edit. But I can still change the size of this in the character window. So I'll go ahead and choose, right now we're at 24 points. I'll go to 72. And maybe I wanna make this bold. So I'll click that. And then I can increase the, uh, the size of the letters right over here. And there's a lot of different options in here. And again, if you're doing just photography, you don't really need to worry about it too much. But if you ever want to create a greeting card or something like that, 
this character window will be really helpful and I just leave that up there all the time. Lastly, we have our layers window. And again, this is the meat and potatoes. This is where obviously all of our layers are. And typically I give this window at least a third of the screen real estate as far as height goes, sometimes more if I have a lot of layers. You can also change the size of these icons simply by control clicking on a Mac or right clicking on a PC and going to the small thumbnail or large or even no thumbnail if you'd like. Just to the left of my main windows, I like to keep a set of collapsed windows that I open one at a time. At the top, I keep my actions, and actions are pre-recorded edits that you can use to save time in Photoshop. For example, if you find yourself doing a technique over and over again, you can simply record that process and save it as an action. So if you look at the top, I have a dodge burn folder, and if I open it up, I have a dodge burn action. So if I go to the bottom and click play, that runs my dodge burn action, which I pre-recorded. Now all I have to do is choose my brush and set the opacity to dodge and burn my image. Now I'm not going to get into the nitty gritty of how to save and record actions. I'll save that for another video, but just know it is a helpful window if you find yourself doing more complex and uh, even just routine edits in Photoshop. Sometimes you can even find actions to download on the internet that people have already created for you. Next up, we have our info window. Now you may or may not use this window very much, just depending on what your workflow is and how much you're printing. You'll notice that when I drag my cursor around the scene, the numbers in the info window change. This is showing me the luminance values of my red, green, and blue, as well as my CMYK channels. The info window can be a really good way to see how your images might print. Any value under 20 in the RGB channels is going to be very dark to almost black. So looking here, I know that these trees are going to have very little detail when I print. Keep in mind, each printing substrate acts differently though. On the other side of the RGB spectrum, 255 represents white. So anytime those values reach into the 240s and 250s, you're going to be pretty much white. Sometimes that might be okay, but it's good to know. Lastly, we have our brushes. This is nice just to, for a quick way to change your brushes. Now, typically as a photographer, you're pretty much just gonna be changing between the soft brush and the hard brush. But if you start to do more fancy things and complicated edits or graphics, this is where all of your brush settings are. And if you really get into graphics and complicated edits, the brush settings can be useful, but for most photography purposes, you're not gonna be using these. These settings tell Photoshop how the brush should act and are mainly used by artists who are trying to recreate actual brushes. Well, okay, that's it. I hope you enjoyed this tutorial. Feel free to leave any questions below in the comments. And of course, don't forget to like and subscribe so I can continue to make these videos for you. On a side note, I offer private post-processing lessons via Zoom. And I also lead a variety of photography workshops all throughout the U.S and a little bit internationally as well. For more information on those, visit naturemike.com, and I look forward to seeing you in the next video.